Okay. As you know, children affected by ADH have a lot of different emotions, but a lot of stress and a lot of anxieties. Anxiety, sorry. So our next uh, speaker has taken time to describe all of this in a study called the Bingo Study. It's not just about uh, the syndrome we're dealing with. She's a PhD student from Cambridge University. This is Jessica Martin. Over to you. Hello. Um, thank you for having me today. So I'm going to start my presentation by zooming out from DDXCX. So we know that rare genetic neurodevelopmental disorders are individually rare, so like DDXX, but collectively they're very common. So neurodevelopmental disorders caused by spontaneous mutations, so de, de novo mutations account for 1 in 214 to 148 births, and there are more than 1,000 genes that have been associated with neurodevelopmental disorders. We also know that mental health symptoms are highly prevalent in children and adolescents with rare genetic neurodevelopmental disorders. A recent study found that approximately 51% of children with rare genetic conditions will experience clinically significant mental health symptoms compared to about 12% of children that don't have a rare genetic condition. And that of particular concern are the high prevalences of anxiety and also oppositional defiant disorder, which is a behavioral disorder characterized by defiant and disobedient behaviors. So where does the bingo project fit into this? I need, is it not work? I know, oh, sorry, I need to speak closer. <laughs> okay. Um, so where does the bingo study fit into this? So the Bingo Project aims to explore the intersection of mental health difficulties and rare genetic conditions. In particular, why are some people with rare genetic neurodevelopmental disorders vulnerable to developing mental health difficulties, but also why mental health difficulties are not universal? So just because you have a rare genetic neurodevelopmental disorder doesn't mean that you'll go on to experience a mental health difficulty. We're also interested in understanding what the characteristics, so what the different symptoms of mental health difficulties might be, including how variable they are and why they might emerge. So finally, I'll start talking about DDX3X, which I know is what everyone here is interested in. So mutations with, in DDX3X have been associated with neurodevelopmental conditions, including intellectual disability and autism, but also mental health symptoms, including anxiety and self-injury. But there are a few limitations with our current existing evidence and the literature that, that we've built up through research. So lots of this research tends to rely on clinical reports and formal diagnosis. And when we do use measures that capture a range of behaviours, we tend to focus on whether that child meets a clinical cutoff or not. And what this means is that we struggle to determine variability in symptoms. So children um, might display a range of different behaviors, but if we're only focusing on those that have lots of those behaviors, then maybe we're missing those that are maybe show a few symptoms. So we're not able to explore variation in severity or the different symptom profiles. And also when we do use these measures, they tend to be designed for populations that didn't have intellectual stability. So typically developing children that then go on to maybe develop anxiety. And it might be the case that the symptoms of anxiety present differently in girls with ddx rex or young children with ddx rex um, So we know in autism that quite often anx anxious traits tend to be related to the autism symptoms. So they might be related to, for example, social difficulties might not be caused through a fear of the social interaction itself, but rather from the fact that it violates patterns or rules, um, which autistic children tend to um, favor. And also that a lot of this research doesn't use a comparison sample. And what this means is that we don't know whether these patterns of behaviors or difficulties are unique or specific to ddx rex or whether they are even beyond what we might expect for the level of developmental or intellectual delay. So um, in our group, we tried to address some of these limitations by um, talking to parents of 46 girls and 23 of those had a daughter with a ddx x mutation and 23 had a daughter with mutation in another, another gene. And we didn't find any differences in the age range or in the level of intellectual stability. So we asked parents to um, 
report on uh, parent reported measures of adaptive behavior. So that's like daily life skills, social communication abilities, motor abilities. And also we use a measure of emotion and behavior that's been specifically designed for people that have intellectual disability or developmental delay and a measure of autism characteristics. And what we found was that there was no difference in adaptive ability between girls that have a mutation in DDXVX versus girls that have a mutation in another gene. And we found also no difference in the levels of autism characteristics. But what we did find is that girls with DDXVX mutations had higher levels of anxiety and higher levels of self-injury. So these may be beh negative behaviours that are directed towards the self, like hand biting or hair pulling or skin scratching. We also found that there might be unique relationships between these different traits. So they might there might be a specific pattern that we see that might be different to what we see in girls that have mutations in different genes. Okay, so to summarize so far, we know that girls with DDXVX associated neurodevelopmental disorder might experience high rates of anxiety and self injurious behaviors. And this might be above and beyond girls that have mutations in different genes. And that there might be unique associations between neurodevelopmental and mental health symptoms in girls with DDXVX. But so far, our evidence is kind of limited by the measures that we use and by our study design. So not comparing girls with and young boys as well, which I know Amelia will talk about in a minute, um, comparing them together. Um, so in my PhD, I wanted to kind of delve into these characteristics in more detail. So I'm trying to explore the characteristics of anxiety in uh, young children and adolescents with DDX associated neurodevelopmental disorder. And to do this, I'm using a bottom up interview with parents and caregivers, and I'm taking a clinical psychology approach. So in clinical psychology, um, part of our um, bread and butter, or in wine, you might say your cheese and in wine, in France, you might say your cheese and your wine, is to think about the different um, factors that might be contributing to whether someone has a difficulty or not. Um, so I'm using what we call a 5P formulation approach, and this involves thinking about someone's presenting difficulty. What is the current issue they're having? What might be triggering that difficulty? What are the behaviours, the emotions, the thoughts that they're feeling? And how frequent, severe, and what is the impact of this difficulty both on themselves and their families? We also think about the factors that might have contributed to the emergence of this difficulty. So Boris mentioned earlier that um, psychiatric conditions co-occur, so they frequently occur together. So we ask about a previous or current experience of depression or any family or developmental history. We also look to see whether there are any events that might have immediately preceded the onset of the anxiety. So sometimes anxiety can be triggered by specific events. For example, if your child was very ill and they had a long period in hospital that was traumatic, or maybe they've had a transition to a new school and having difficulty establishing new relationships or friendships. We also look at factors which might maintain the anxiety. Um, so something we sometimes do when we're anxious is we avoid the thing that makes us anxious. But by avoiding the thing that makes us anxious, we never learn that there's a different outcome, that actually that could be a positive experience or um, that it's a safe environment. Finally, we look at protective factors. These are factors that contribute to resilience and strength and are things that reduce the impact that the difficulty might be having on our daily lives. So, um, so far in my PhD, I've interviewed 13 parents and caregivers of girls with ddx 3 x mutations. And um, just to note that this was not just mothers, we also had a mother, father and a mother and her partner um, that we interviewed. And we found that nine of these caregivers reported that their daughter experienced some level of anxiety or um, some kind of anxiety. And just to note that we didn't find any differences in the age range of these two groups. So the group with parent reported anxiety versus the group that didn't have any anxiety and no difference in their level of developmental delay either. Um, so what about the anxiety itself? So we found that parents reported that the anxiety can emerge at any stage through life. So um, some parents reported that their child had always been quite anxious from when they were a baby. Um, most parents reported that arised in middle child, but also um, into as a teenager. And that all of the types of anxiety parents reported was triggered. So this means there was, there's a specific event or um, uh, object or situation that 
they dislike um, rather than there being a constant level of anxiety, which we might call generalized anxiety. And that the, also all of the parents reported that their child's anxiety emerged quite gradually over time. So it wasn't one day their child woke up and they were anxious and they weren't the day before. So did parents report that there were any factors that might have contributed to the emergence of anxiety? So in particular, we asked parents about whether their child had any previous or current experiences of depression. And we found that no parents reported any depressive symptoms or behaviors related to depression. And what about any events that might have occurred immediately before the onset of anxiety? We only found that one parent reported that there might have been an event that was linked to their child developing anxiety, which in this case was transitioning to a new school and having difficulty establishing new friendships or leaving old friendships behind. So that was um, factors that might contribute or precede the onset of the anxiety. What about factors that are triggering that anxiety? So the current difficulty or issue that's causing someone to become anxious. So parents were allowed to report on multiple different factors that might have con that might have caused their daughter or patterns that they saw that they saw like, um, for example, or when we go to the supermarket, she becomes really anxious. Or um, when we go to the park and she sees a dog, she becomes really anxious. Um, so parents reported on a wide number and the most common were routine changes new situations and sensory sensitivity. So this was something that Effie mentioned earlier that um, her daughter experienced as well. Um, and just to note that um, there were some parents that reported specific phobias, one of dogs and one of babies and small children. As you can see from the graph that actually there are a number of different factors that might have triggered anxiety, including kind of a lack of sleep or social performance and performance situations. So what behaviours do girls show when they're anxious? So we ask parents to describe what their daughter looks like when she's anxious. Does she show any changes in the way she communicates, in her facial expressions, in her behaviour and her movement? Um, and also in physiological symptoms. So things like having a faster beating heart or breathing more heavily or going very red and flushed. So again, parents could report multiple different behaviours because we don't just show one thing when we're anxious, she shows multiple different changes. And the most common changes we found were crying, repetitive speech, maintaining distance, muscle tension, and talking to others. And um, one thing to note is um, that we found that parents found it quite difficult to report physiological symptoms, so things like changes in heart rate, which kind of makes sense. It's sometimes difficult to know whether your own heart rate is changing when you're stressed, let alone thinking about whether there's changes in your child. And um, I forgot to mention earlier, but um, this same uh, kind of Framework has been used to look at anxiety in Williams syndrome, which is another genetic syndrome where individuals experience high levels of anxiety. And then um, they also found that parents found it quite difficult to report um, physiological symptoms. Okay, um, so that was the behaviors. So let's start thinking about how frequent, severe, and the impact of the anxiety. We found that parents reported that anxiety was somewhat frequent in their girls, occurring. Um, most frequently at least once a week or once a day, and that the anxiety had a mild to moderate severity. And what this means is that the symptoms are noticeable to others. They might have some lasting physiological symptoms, but it's actually quite easily overcome and it doesn't severe significantly with everyday functioning or relationships. And we found that actually a lot of parents felt that the anxiety didn't really impact their daughter um, in any way, then most parents reported no impact or a mild impact, but actually parents are reporting that the anxiety was having quite a significant impact on them or their family's ability to kind of go about daily routines or family activities. So um, that was um, the impact and severity. So what about strategies? How are people coping and what are people doing? So perpetuating factors can be thought of as factors that might maintain the anxiety, but also how people manage the anxiety. So we found that parents used to both active and avoidant coping strategies. So this includes things like reassurance and giving comfort. Effie again mentioned earlier things like deep pressure, hugs, weighted blankets, they can provide comfort, but also things like distraction. So drawing, singing, eating, all the things that your daughters might enjoy, you can use to distract them from while they're feeling anxious. And then also doing things like avoiding triggers and events or removing from situations that might cause them to become anxious. 
And how are people coping? So we asked parents to report how they were coping on a scale of zero being absolutely no control through all the way to 10 being an extreme amount of control. And we found that parents reported that they had a reasonable amount of control. But it's important to note that there's quite a lot of variability here. Some parents were finding it very difficult to feel in control, whereas others really felt like they had their, um, the child's anxiety down. OK, so to summarise here, in um, our preliminary interview evidence from that suggests that anxiety tends to be a response to specific triggers in girls that have DDX reacts, including routine changes, new situations, and sensory sensitivities, and that a wide range of anxious behaviours um, are displayed, including crying, repetitive speech, and maintaining distance from a trigger. And that anxiety is somewhat frequent and mild to moderate in severity, and parents use a variety of coping strategies and feel that they are reasonably in control. So that's what we've done so far. So what's next? So as I mentioned at the beginning, one of the main limitations of some of the research in this area is that we don't include a comparison sample. So we can't ask questions like, are these behaviors unique to girls and young people with PDX or X mutations? And are there maybe specific patterns in the way these symptoms or difficulties emerge? So I'm trying to do that in my PhD by comparing these characteristics in girls that have DDX or X mutations and girls that have mutations in other genes. And we're doing this by using parent report measures of anxiety, autism characteristics, um, challenging behaviors, including self-injury and aggression, and also communication differences. And um, sensory processing, we mentioned earlier that some girls might experience sensory sensitivity. So we think it's important to look at that too. We also want to explore possible pathways that might contribute to anxiety or might um, be a factor in why it might emerge. And we're looking again at sensory processing, um, the communication. I think in Angela's talk, she talked about how movement and difficulty to kind of produce words might contribute to difficulties that girls have with language. So is it the case that actually, if you can't express how you're thinking or what you're feeling, that actually you might show anxious behaviors because you're trying to communicate that? Um, I'm also interested in looking at self-regulation. And what I mean by self-regulation is how do you um, regulate or control your emotional reactions when maybe something upsets you or makes you very excited? And um, the way we're doing that is using a combination of games um, and looking at um, changes in heart rate and physical activity. So this is me um, wearing a small monitor that measures my heart rate and my physical movement. And this is my setup. So here we've got a table with lots of cameras and different toys. And some of the tasks we use, some of you might have seen on Instagram or Facebook, which is where parents might give their, their child a treat. Like um, we use marshmallows and we say, here's one marshmallow. I'm going to give you this marshmallow and you can eat it now. Or here's a second marshmallow. If you wait, while I leave you, then you can have two marshmallows. So we're interested in the kinds of behaviors that children are showing when they're trying to stop touching the marshmallow. So the marshmallow is something they really want. What do they do when they can't have something they really want? Or conversely, we give them a toy and we take it away. What happens when they have something they really like taken away from them? So we're interested in looking at that ability to regulate your emotions because potentially, if you're worse at regulating those emotions, you might be more likely to find things that you might be more likely to go on to develop anxiety or have difficulties responding to things that you find difficult in your environment. So why might this matter? Why does this research matter? So we're hoping through this research, we can identify behaviors and um, traits that might be indicators of anxiety. So um, as I mentioned earlier, if um, girls are DDX, we know that some of them might have difficulty with language. And if you com can't communicate your thoughts and feelings, you might express your behaviors through your emotion, your, your emotions through your behaviors. So um, by identifying what these behaviors are, we might be able to better inform future diagnosis and enable girls to get better intervention and support. This doesn't mean that you can't still get that support now. And also by looking at variability, we're raising awareness that neurodevelopmental and mental health characteristics on an inevitable consequence of having a DDX or X diagnosis. And some girls might go on to develop a different patterns and different strengths and difficulties. Um, and that's why we're looking at um, what factors might contribute to the emergence of these over time.
Um, also, just to mention, finally, um, we're still actively recruiting. I'm halfway through my PhD. So if you have a daughter who is aged between three and 18 years old and has a DVX to X mutation, and I know there are clinicians and people that are working with broader um, charities that look at children that have different genetic conditions, um, we're also looking to recruit those children too so we can understand differences and maybe unique pattern changes. And finally, just want to say thank you to the bingo team, um, my supervisor, Kate Baker, and also my supervisor, Sam, who's based at the University of East London. Um, he provides the um, monitors that measure heart rate and physical activity. And to um, PIs, Jane Waite and Rachel Royston, who have been really helpful in informing the research looking at anxiety. Um, but finally, the biggest thank you goes to all of the families who've taken part in the bingo project, because this work wouldn't be possible without you. Merci, merci Jessica Martin. Maybe you can get thank back. Thank you, to the Jessica. Slide. Thank you. Maybe you can go back to the previous slide mm -hmm. if people want to write down your email address. So if your if the English rugby players are as fast as you are, tomorrow at the Stade de France they're going to eat the Argentinian uh, team alive and they will avenge the French team who lost uh, the quarterfinals. So thank you very much to the two previous speakers.